Well, good evening and welcome to Tuesday night's devotion and prayer time. I'm Pastor Andrew Columbia, and I'm going to give it a few moments for people to join me online. And tonight we are going to pray. But before we do that, we're going to do a devotion. And my devotion is going to be from the book of Matthew, chapter six, starting in verse five through verse 18. So I'm going to give it a few minutes for, for a few more people to join. So welcome as you're joining. I have one dear faithful sister here with me. So praise God. <laughs> and we're going to we're going to seek the Lord in prayer and we're going to seek the face of God tonight because we all need it. Wouldn't you agree with me? We need more of God in our lives every single day. We need more peace, more joy, more hope, more healing, more power, and most importantly, more love because God is love. So what I want to do to build our faith tonight, and we know this, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So as we do a devotion and as we read the scriptures, and what we're going to read tonight are the words of Jesus. This is in the book of Matthew chapter 6, and it is the portion of this book where the focus is on prayer and fasting. And it's Jesus teaching his disciples how to pray. And I was on a call today with pastors. I do a, a monthly conference call with the pastor fellowship that I'm affiliated with. And I'm on that call with pastors from all over the world. Most of them are in South Africa, some are in Cyprus, um, all different parts, different countries, Zimbabwe. It's a great fellowship of, of ministers who get together monthly for prayer, for fellowship. And what we were talking about today was leading the congregation in prayer. And, and how do you encourage your congregation? How do you teach your congregation to pray? And what was interesting, some of the younger pastors that are only pastoring a couple of years were admitting that they struggled praying for a long time. I'm not going to mention their names. <laughs> I'm not going to throw anyone under the bus in case they're watching this. But um, I just want to use it as an example. And they were being honest and transparent that how, you know, I don't know how to pray that long. And, and you know, how do you encourage the congregation to pray? Well, there's there's several different components to prayer. It's not just speaking and, and talking to God. It's, it's listening. It's meditating. It's, it's reading the word and praying the word. And it's strategic. So what I want to emphasize today in this devotion, before we get into some strategic prayer, and that's why I call it an hour of power prayer, because we're coming together to intercede and pray for what is important first and foremost to God. And then after we cover those bases with adoration, then we go through confession and we have to make sure our hearts are clean. So Jesus gives us a blueprint here in Matthew chapter six. And again, when I do Bible studies, Bible teachings, preachings, I usually use the New King James Version and the Amplified Version. But for this devotion tonight, it's a devotion. I'm going to use the New Living Translation, which is a paraphrased translation. So stay with me. I'm going to read through it. And as I'm reading, I'm going to stop and interject as I feel led. Because once again, this is a devotion. It's not a sermon or a Bible study. So let me open up with a word of prayer. Father, I just thank you for this time with my brothers and sisters tonight. Those that are here, those that are online with me right now. And I pray that the Holy Spirit would truly order our steps. Your word is clear that the steps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord. And we know that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And the just shall live by faith alone. So Father, I pray for this devotion tonight. I pray for the scriptures that we're going to be reading here in Matthew chapter 6. That through the words of Jesus himself. Lord, I pray that you would open up our understanding. I pray for rich revelation. I pray that the Holy Spirit would give us wisdom and discernment and strategy so we can learn how to tarry in prayer. That means not just say the same things over and over again, but tarry in prayer. So Lord, I thank you for this time tonight. I thank you for those who are joining me. And I ask the Holy Spirit to order each word that is shared here from the scriptures and I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. All right, follow along with me. Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 5. The context of this devotion is prayer. And it's Jesus teaching the disciples, the apostles, 
about prayer and fasting. So verse five says this, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, that is all the reward they will ever get. Now let me stop there and just emphasize that verse. He starts out by not saying what is the right way to pray. He's starting out by saying what is the wrong way to pray. And what he's saying here is don't do it for wrong motives. Don't do it for attention. Don't pray to show people how spiritual you think you are. Jesus always looks at the motives and intents of our hearts. He always wants to know the cause and the effect. Why are we doing what we're doing? And what effect is it going to have when we do it? So there's always a cause and effect. And in chapter six, verse five of Matthew, he's saying, don't be like hypocrites. So those who pray in the street, street he's calling them hypocrites. Why? Because they want attention. They're doing it so other people can look at them and say, wow, look how spiritual they are. Look how holy they are. God wants us humble. How many of you know that? He doesn't want us to be super spiritual, acting in ways that are hypocritical and not real. He wants us to be transparent, humble. So, so what I want to emphasize here is that he's telling us, don't be like hypocrites. Don't pray in front of people all the time. Now, there's times to go out in the streets and pray. When you're doing evangelism, when you're doing outreach, when you're praying for your community, when you're praying to tear down strongholds over, over territories, there's times to do that. But he's addressing the, the wrong way to pray because the people he's addressing are the Pharisees. And he's calling them hypocrites and self-seeking and self-serving. And basically what he's saying, that's the only reward they're going to get, that the Father in heaven is not going to honor that type of prayer. Let's look at verse 6 now. But when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your father in private. Then your father who sees everything will reward you. Now again, there's different types of prayer. There's personal prayer and there's corporate prayer. When we come tonight, like having a prayer meeting, it's corporate prayer. And even though most of you are online, you're praying with me, you're listening with me. So this is a time of corporate prayer, but Jesus is stressing what's important when it comes to intimacy with the Father. And he's saying, go by yourself, get alone with your Father, behind the closed doors and pray to your Father in private. Now, Jesus did a lot of modeling of this when he was carrying out his ministry on the earth. What Jesus would do is, he would break away from the disciples many times, early in the morning, throughout the day, late at night, and he would get alone with his father and pray alone to his father in secret. This is why the disciples asked Jesus how to pray. They wanted to know how to pray because they were saying, what is he doing all these time, all this time? How is he praying? How many words could he say? What is he talking about with God? They didn't understand intimacy. They didn't understand meditation. They didn't understand what tarrying is in the Lord. That means just dwelling in his presence feasting at his table, surrounded by his glory. Amen. That's actually a song, In His Presence by Don Moen. And, and God wants us to spend that kind of time with him in private. Now, let me just give a little injection here of my personal prayer life to encourage you and to strengthen you. I get up real early in the morning. I mean, super early, between three and four o'clock. I've been doing it for years. And I get alone with my father in private I sit quietly most of the times in the dark. Sometimes I will put on soft instrumental worship music, not words, instrumental music. And I just meditate with the words and, and with, there's some great um, programs you can watch on, on YouTube actually, that watch I watch, which actually have these instrumental hymns and beautiful scenery. And some of them put scripture verses up and I just meditate when I first wake up because I'm still kind of in a fog a little bit. So I'm, I'm meditating and I'm just allowing the, the words of the music and the words I'm seeing on the screen, the visuals, I'm just taking, I'm soaking it in. I'm soaking in God's presence. I'm, I'm spending time with God and it's intimate because it's just me and him. There's no distractions at all. It's very early in the morning. Nobody's up, mostly very quiet. And that's my time with God. 
So I start with that meditation. I call it meditation because I'm really not talking. I'm just spending time in God's presence. And I'm using some visual aids. I'm using some instrumental music. I'm, I'm just spending that. I'm using the darkness that I'm focused. It's not things that I'm looking at. I get along with my father and I pray to my father in secret. And I start with meditation. And that's important that we understand how to do this because you can tarry in God's presence like that for a long time. And sometimes I do. I just soak it in. I'm just spending time with the Lord. And, and the Bible says this, that the Holy Spirit intercedes with our spirit with groans and utterings that words cannot even express. So it's those are the times where the Holy Spirit is communing with your spirit and you're getting fed. And it's, it's, it's supernatural. It's spiritual. And, and I love those moments. I cherish those moments. I long for those moments when I get up each and every morning. No other way to start my day. And then after I spend that time in meditation, I begin to pray verbally. And I always begin with adoration. And I'll talk more about that as we read on. So back to verse 6. But when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your father in private. Then your father who sees everything will reward you. See, God wants that relationship. He wants that intimacy. He wants us to spend that one-on-one -on -one time with him. Why wouldn't he? He's our heavenly father. And those of us who understand good parenting, and those of us who love our parents and love our children, we want to spend time with them. We want that one-on-one -on -one time. We want that intimacy. It's very important. So I just want to encourage you there. That's what God wants, your private time. He wants that alone time. He wants that meditation and prayer time. And he's going to reward you for that. Those are the things that are done in secret that God sees, nobody else sees. But we get rewarded for those things. Just like there's a lot of evil done in secret behind closed doors where people can't see. God sees everything and he looks at the motives and intents of our hearts. If we put on a show in front of other people and try to act holy and spiritual just when we're around people so we can feel good or, or think that we're showing uh, other people that we're, we're good or we look spiritual, that's hypocritical. That is of the flesh. That's not of God. God's more concerned with you getting along with him. Get along with your father and pray to him in secret. Praise God. And he's going to reward you for that. Let's look at verse 7. When you pray, don't babble on and on as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them, for your father knows exactly what you need, even before you ask him. This is very important, and I want to spend a few minutes talking about this. God doesn't want repetitive prayer, where we're just saying the same things over and over and over again. That's babbling on. He doesn't want that. He says, don't do that. And he's using Gentiles here. But remember, Jesus came first for the Jew. And his audience, when he was talking here, were Jews. They were his disciples, apostles. And he was telling them, don't babble like the Gentiles do. Pray to foreign gods. They do mantras. They do chants. They're very repetitive. It's over and over and over again. That's not how God wants us to pray. So Jesus is giving clear instruction here. That's not the way you pray. Don't be like the Gentiles. He says, your father knows what you need even before you ask him. This is very important. It's a mindset that we need to have so we're not desperate when we come before God. See, God wants your intimacy and your heart. He already knows what you need. Jesus is saying here, Jesus is God. Jesus is God. And he's telling his disciples that when you pray, that God knows exactly what you need even before you ask so if he knows your needs, and the Bible says that he wants to supply us with all of our needs, not wants, not greeds, needs. There's a big difference between wants, greeds, and needs. How many of you know that? God answers prayer according to our needs, and he already knows them. So when our heart does not line up with his heart, when, when our prayers sometimes are off kilter, they're not lined up, they're not aligned right, God's not going to answer those type of prayers. Because those prayers are not according to his will. And the Bible says, ask anything according to my will and it shall be given unto you. So it's his will, his way, his time. We have to learn to seek the Father in spirit and truth. And we have to learn and understand that God already knows our needs. So really what he wants is honesty, humility, sincerity. That's what he's looking for. 
He wants our hearts to be aligned with his heart. That's what's most important. He already knows what we need. And he wants us to ask, just like a child. When you love your children and you spend time with them and you see they're troubled, or if they want to talk to you about something, you want to hear what they have to say. And if you know them well enough, a lot of times you know what's going on even before they tell you. Well, how much more does your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask in faith and believe? How much more does God know? He's God. He's infinite. He's all-knowing. He's all-seeing. He's omnipotent, omnipresent. So, then verse 9, Matthew 6, 9. This is the Lord's Prayer. Now, let me preface this by saying this. The Lord's Prayer is Scripture. It's the Word of God. So we can pray the Lord's Prayer. And I pray the Lord's Prayer sometimes. But it's not to be prayed repetitively over and over and over again. Jesus just told us that. That's not how we pray. So, what does that mean? When we read the Lord's Prayer, which I'm going to do in a moment with you, it's a blueprint. Are you hearing me? It's a blueprint for how we are to pray and how we are to approach God. There's several components in the Lord's Prayer, which I'm going to teach on tonight. And then I'm going to begin to pray them because we're going to pray. And that's the strategy. That's the, the model that Jesus gave his disciples so they can tarry in prayer. So they can go to the Father numerous times throughout the day. And they can petition him the correct way. So... Let's look at the Lord's Prayer. We're going to break it down, and I'm going to begin to pray as I break it down. Verse 9, once again, pray like this, Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. Now I'm going to stop there for a minute and expound on that. God is holy. God cannot dwell where sin is. We worship God in spirit and truth because of his holiness, because of his attributes, and because of his character. So when we begin to pray this way, our Father who art in heaven, our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. What Jesus is teaching the disciples is to worship God for who he is, for his character, for his attributes, for his goodness, for his provision, for his protection, for his strength. Before you ask him for anything, this is a mindset. This is teaching us how to think on what is good, pleasing, and perfect. This is teaching us how to approach the Father and build our faith so that as we begin with adoration and worship when we go through the Lord's Prayer, our faith is becoming stronger in God, in who He is, what He's accomplished, what He's done, and in His holiness. So that immediately before you ask God for anything, your faith is growing and increasing but the focus is on the Father. Your problems become smaller when your faith gets stronger. Amen? So, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We thank you, Father, that you are Jehovah Jireh, our provider. And you provide for all of our needs according to your riches and glory. We thank you, Father, that you are Jehovah Shalom. Jehovah is peace. And you give us a peace that surpasses all understanding. We worship you for that, Father. We thank you, Lord, that you are Jehovah Mekedesh, Jehovah, our sanctification. And that as we become Christians, you're conforming us, transforming us into the image of your son, Jesus Christ. It's a process, but we thank you for sanctification. We thank you, Father, that you are Jehovah Sikenu, Jehovah, our righteousness. This is a big one, brothers and sisters. We are in right relationship with the Lord because of Jesus Christ. Righteousness means right standing. We're no longer positioned as sinners separated from God. We are now righteous through the blood of Christ, which we're saved by grace and faith. And our position before the Father is not guilty because of the righteousness of Christ. So we're saints, not sinners. I stress this all the time in my teaching and preaching because a lot of people have victim mentality and they look at themselves as sinners and they call themselves sinners all the time. You're saved by grace and faith. You're a saint. You have been positioned in right standing in and through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. You can approach the Father with boldness and courage and humility because of your position in Christ. So we thank you, Lord, that you are Jehovah, Sekenu, Jehovah, our righteousness. Please get that deep in your spirit. 
When you pray, you're in right standing, but you're a saint, you're not a sinner. Do we sin and mess up at times as Christians? Yes, because we still have a sinful nature, the flesh nature. But when we sin, we repent. And repentance is changing the way you think. It's turning from our sin and the Holy Spirit gives you the power from on high not to go back to it. And through that sanctification transformation process, God is making us more like Jesus. Old things are passing away and all things are becoming new in Christ. So Father, we thank you. You are Jehovah Sikenu, Jehovah our righteousness. Praise God. We are honoring the Lord's prayer, the first part of it, where it says, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We thank you, Father, that you are Jehovah Rofa, Jehovah our healer. Now I talk about healing a lot because it's in the covenant of the New Testament through the blood of Christ. We have healing in our covenant. But God heals in his will, his way, his time. We're to pray for healing. We're to pray without ceasing. The Bible tells us if any of you is sick, we just did this Sunday in our church, have the elders of the church anoint the sick with oil and pray a prayer of faith and the sick person shall be made well. The biblical model, the biblical mandate is so important. We got to honor the word. Amen. And we're to confess our sins to one another and pray for one another that we may be healed. The prayers of the righteous are powerful and effective. James 5, 16. So we are to pray constantly for healing, but don't be mistaken. God heals in his will, his way, his time. He's not a genie. We don't rub him and he does exactly what we want. There's purpose for everything in the kingdom of God. God does things according to his will, not our will. You have to understand that. Amen. But he is Jehovah Rapha. Jehovah, our healer. We're talking about the attributes and the character of God. We're adoring him and worshiping him before we ask him anything. And this is the blueprint of how Jesus taught the disciples how to pray. Not to pray the Lord's Prayer repetitively over and over and over again. Like some of us were taught growing up. It's a blueprint for how would you approach God. Father, we thank you that you also are Jehovah Rohi, the good shepherd. And we, your sheep, we hear your voice and we follow you. Now, the Bible tells us in John chapter 10 that God is the good shepherd and we are the sheep and we hear his voice. How do we hear God's voice? Primarily through his word, through the word of God, the canon, the 66 books of scripture. God speaks to us every single time we open the Bible. We crack it open and we read it. Why? All scripture is inspired. It's God breath. For the correction, edification, reproof of the believers. God gave us his word. And his word has great power and authority. So God speaks through his word. And we have to be stewards of the word. Disciples of the word. So we don't lack wisdom. So when we pray, we know what God is telling us in and through his word. He also speaks through the Holy Spirit. Who indwells us. Who leads us and guides us into all truth. Thank God we're born again. Thank God we're blood bought. Thank God that Jesus paid the price for our sin on the cross. Thank God we're saved by grace and faith, not by works that no one should boast. It's a gift of God. Thank the Lord for that. And thank God that the Holy Spirit is the counselor, the comforter and the guide. And he's leading us and guiding us into all truth. Can I get an amen? So Father, we thank you that you are Jehovah Rohi, the good shepherd. And we, your sheep, we hear your voice and we follow you in and through your word and in the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for intimacy. We thank you for fellowship. We thank you for truth and life, which comes through your word and by your Holy Spirit. Father, we give you all the glory, all the honor and all the praise. You alone deserve it in Jesus mighty name. Amen. Now, let me stop here for a moment and say this. Jesus Gave us the Lord's Prayer. That was just verse 9. So in verse 9, we're learning adoration. We're learning how to worship the Father for who He is, all He's done, and all He's given us without asking Him for one thing. That strategic prayer, my brothers and sisters. Let's continue. Verse 10 says this. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Focus. What does God want us to focus on? This is huge. You want a sound mind? You want a clear conscience? You want peace and joy in your heart? 
listen to Jesus talk about how we are to pray. The focus is on the kingdom of God. It's not on us. It's not on you. It's not on me. It's not on the government. It's not on the economy. It's not on anything other than the kingdom. This is what's a priority to God. May your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Everything that's done in heaven is taught to us here in the word so we can receive the treasure from heaven in our lives. Oh, this is good stuff. So we got to pray for the kingdom to come. We know we're studying the book of Revelation. We're, we're at the end of the tribulation period. What do we all know is going to take place on this earth at the right time? Jesus is coming back. Amen. He's going to rule and reign on this earth with us, the saints of God. The thousand year millennial reign is coming after the tribulation. Amen. So our focus needs to be on the kingdom. Our focus needs to be on souls. Our focus needs to be preaching the gospel, which is the good news of Jesus Christ. What is the gospel? It's laid out very clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 4. Also in John 3, 16. The gospel is this, that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. He died on the cross and shed his blood for the sins of all humanity. He rose again on the third day. He ascended into heaven. He's seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for you and me. And we are commissioned in Scripture to go and proclaim the gospel to every tribe, every tongue, every nation. We're to make disciples praising the Lord, preaching the kingdom, and baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We have to present the truth. That should be our focus. Who do we present it to? Our sphere of influence. And God gives us the wisdom and the ability to do that. He tells us to be wise as serpents, gentle as doves, and the Holy Spirit will give us that kind of wisdom. We're not zealots running around beating everybody over the head with Bibles. Sometimes when we get newly saved, I know I did. I was so excited, so zealous about my faith. I, I went off and I just was, was a little too aggressive and too hard and turned a lot of people off. A lot of people do that when they first get saved because they're on fire. They're zealous. They want other people to know what they've experienced, the love, the mercy, the grace, and the forgiveness of God. But the reality of it is people aren't there. We present truth by our character. Listen to me. God's more concerned with our character than he is our talent and ability. As you are being conformed into the image and likeness of Christ, as you're learning the scriptures, as the Holy Spirit's working in you, you're changing because God's changing you. God is the one changing you. And as you're changing, people see it. And two things happen. Either they're drawn to the change in you or they're repelled by it. And why? It's a spiritual change. When you're born again, you're born in spirit. You receive the Holy Spirit. You have something you've never had before. So people who are not saved, who are not born again, they have a different spirit. So we need to understand these things. So we're praying that the kingdom of heaven would come to this earth. We're praying that God would use us as ambassadors, stewards, and servants to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. And let me just say this. If you've truly received salvation, if you're truly born again, born in spirit, you have a testimony. You have a story to tell because you've been forgiven for your sins. You've been washed by the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony. And when God changes your heart, when God delivers you from all kinds of evil, when God forgives you of all your sins, you want to tell the world. And the word and the spirit give you the wisdom and know how to do that. That's the focus. Preach the gospel. Preach the good news. Why? Because... This world is but a vapor in the scope of eternity. Why? Because we're all going to die. The Bible says it's appointed once for man to die and then the judgment. There's a judgment for those who don't know Christ and that's hell. But for the believers, absence from this body is presence with the Lord because we're born again. We've been washed. We've been sanctified. We've been justified by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. So, the focus is 
worshiping God. This is how you pray. For who he is, for his character, his attributes, his might, his salvation, his healing, his deliverance. Father, we thank you for these things. And Father, may your kingdom come, may your will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. That's the focus. Bringing the kingdom. Proclaiming the good news. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He died for our sins. He resurrected. He ascended. He's coming back to dwell on this earth, to rule and reign for all eternity. And if you accept Christ, you're forgiven, you're healed, you're sanctified, you're washed, and you're set free. Praise God. What better message is there in this world? There is none. It's the greatest message, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Oh, I hope that you made that decision. I hope that you've truly repented and called upon the Lord so you can be saved and set free and filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen? If you haven't done it, do it now. Choose to do it. Repent and turn to Jesus and he'll set you free. Praise God. So we're calling heaven to earth. We're presenting the kingdom. Verse 11. Give us today the food we need. Our daily bread in some other versions. Give us this day our daily bread. We need food. We need daily bread to live. We need nourishment. We need food. We need water for our bodies. We need the daily bread of the word for our soul and our spirit. Because we need to be renewed in and through the Lord. And by the Holy Spirit. And that comes through the washing of the word. We have to feast at the table of the Lord by ingesting the word of God. When we pray, I talked about meditation. Spending time alone with God. And then we reflect upon the word. We read the scriptures. We fill our spirit with the word of God to build our faith, to strengthen us. And there's so many scriptures that we can turn to for encouragement and strength. And I think of Psalm 1, like a tree planted by streams of living water, whose leaves never wither or run dry. Isn't that awesome? The Holy Spirit is like streams of living water, constantly refreshing us and renewing us. We're being filled with the Holy Spirit Daily, we're being washed by the Spirit like a stream where anything in it, if it's dirty, it's going to be pushed out. If it's unclean, it's going to be smoothed over. The Holy Spirit is like a stream of living water. So, Father, we rejoice and we thank you for daily bread. We thank you for the Word. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. We thank you for renewing us every day and feeding us and nurturing us with your presence, your power, your love, and your Word. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Are you following me tonight? This strategic way to pray, the Lord's Prayer. We've only covered three verses. Verses 9, verses 10, and verses 11. And there's more. Let's continue. Verse 12. And forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. Forgiveness. 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 This is the heart of God. Jesus went to that cross for one purpose. To die for our sins and forgive us for every sin we've ever committed. The heart of the Father is love and forgiveness. You got to get this part right, people. You cannot harbor unforgiveness in your heart. You have to forgive. So we have to make sure we're running to the cross and repenting when we do sin. And what is sin? It's missing the mark, falling short. That's what sin means. Missing the mark, missing God's standards. Falling short of what God says is righteous. And because we have a, a flesh nature, there are times we miss the mark. There are times we sin. But thank God for the cross. Thank God we can run to Jesus and repent of our sin and turn from it. And we have the Holy Spirit. We have the word. We have power from on high. So we don't have excuses to live in sinful patterns and behaviors. The Bible is very clear. We are to no longer live as the world lives. Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will know God's good, pleasing, and perfect will. Listen. Don't make grace cheap. Grace is free, but it's not cheap. Once you have the truth and once you have the Holy Spirit, there's no excuses to live in ways that are displeasing to God. Sometimes we're being sanctified and it's a battle. But God tells us the Holy Spirit purifies us and washes us through the refiner's fire so that we become like gold. 
Don't make excuses for the Holy Spirit's not going to lead you in a bar to get drunk. The Holy Spirit's not going to lead you to get high. The Holy Spirit's not going to lead you to hold on to anger and unforgiveness and bitterness in your heart. The Holy Spirit does the exact opposite. He leads us towards repentance through conviction and brokenness and surrender and humility. And when we get to that place, we get cleansed by the Spirit. And that's when we truly repent, turn away from our sins, call upon the Lord and be washed whiter than snow. Are you listening to me tonight? I hope you're listening. Because the Word of God is truth and life. And if you're not getting this part right, you're not going to be able to approach the Father the way He wants you to. So we must... Ask God for forgiveness when we sin. And turn away from all sin. Turn away from all wickedness. Turn away from sinful habits and behaviors. The Bible is loaded with teaching in the New Testament and the epistles about holy living. Read it in scripture. Read Colossians chapter 3 about rules for holy living. God doesn't want us getting drunk. God doesn't want us having filthy language come out of our mouth. God does not want us talking evil about people. God does not want us holding grudges. All these things are sinful habits and behaviors. And through the word and the power of the Holy Spirit, we can repent and turn and walk in the freedom of Christ. There's no excuses to live that way. The Bible says a double-minded person is unstable in all their ways, tossed to and fro like a wave of the sea. Someone like that should ask nothing of God. They're not going to receive it. There's no excuses. Don't be a hypocrite. Don't say you love God and curse people. Don't say you love God and you're serving the Lord and you're getting drunk and doing all these things that God says are not right. Repent and turn and God will forgive you and wash you. Amen. So we have to keep our hearts clean. And then it says, and forgive us for our sins as we are forgiven those who sin against us. Oh, this is a big one. Listen to me. Listen to me. You must forgive. You must forgive. I don't care who the offender was. I don't care what the offense is. How difficult, how hard. Listen, I know a lot of you have been through some very dark paths. I know you've suffered tremendous hurt and brokenness in your life. I know you've been hurt and wounded terribly. Jesus was hurt and wounded more than any of us, more than all of us put together, and he didn't deserve it. He's the only one that's righteous because he's God. And he willingly laid down his life for you and me. He willingly forgave us for our sins. We have no excuse not to forgive. We cannot stand before a holy God with unforgiveness, bitterness in our hearts. You must forgive. And Jesus is teaching us that here in the Lord's Prayer. Father, I pray right now for my brothers and sisters. Search our hearts. Any areas of our hearts that we're holding on to bitterness, resentment, unforgiveness. Father, I pray you would break those areas. I pray, God, that the Holy Spirit would do a work on the inside of our hearts through the washing of the word that would break down those strongholds, those mindsets, those areas where we have self-righteousness and pride. Those areas where we will not repent or turn because we're still holding on to grief and bitterness and pain. Father, I pray you break those things in our hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Do you see how the Lord's Prayer is not to be prayed repetitively? Do you see how this is the way we approach God? Are you looking at this as a strategic blueprint? Because that's what it is. That's what it is. Let's continue. Verse 13. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. Again, I want to make this very clear. God is not a man that he should lie, number one. God will never tempt us or lead us towards evil. There's good in this world. There's God who's good all the time and holy and righteous. And there's evil in this world. And we know Satan is the father of evil. He's the father of all lies. He's a deceiver, a murderer, and a liar. And he comes to kill, rob, and destroy. Whenever you hear the voice of guilt, whenever you hear the voice of condemnation, whenever you hear the voice that attacks you and accuses you or puts all evil thoughts or fearful things in your mind, that is not the voice of God. That is the devil. And the Bible says this, draw near to God, rebuke the enemy, and he will flee from you. 
Listen to me and listen to me carefully. Don't give in to temptation. You're going to be tempted. People are going to tempt you to sin. They're going to tempt you to gossip. They're going to tempt you to hate other people. Misery loves company. Have you figured that out yet? But the Bible tells me and you that the joy of the Lord is our strength. And the peace and the joy of the Lord is, is how we live and move and have our being. And I am not going to allow any person or any devil to corrupt my thinking and my heart with anger, bitterness, fear, confusion. Those things are not of God. And I rebuke them in the name of Jesus. And you need to do the same thing. You need to rebuke those thoughts and those lies of the devil in the name of Jesus. Somebody give me an amen. Praise God. The Holy Spirit will never lead us towards temptation. He's always going to lead you towards truth and righteousness. He's always going to lead you towards streams of living water to be refreshed and encouraged and strengthened because he's God. The Holy Spirit is God. and He lives in you and me if we're born again. Praise the Lord. But rescue us from the evil one. Now, let me tell you this. Listen carefully to what I'm going to tell you. The only one who can deliver us from evil is God. We cannot fight the devil with our own strength. We cannot fight the devil or evil on our own terms. We have to draw near to the Lord, submit to the Lord, resist the devil, and he has to flee because he has to submit to God. God is the creator of the universe. God is sovereign. He's on the throne. And every created being, including the devil and all the demons, have to submit to the lordship of Jesus Christ. The Bible says every tongue shall confess, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. This is good stuff. I hope you're getting this. I hope you're listening. I hope that your heart is being cauterized and sanctified by the word of truth and the word of life. This is how we pray the Lord's Prayer. So, Father, I pray with my brothers and sisters right now. Deliver us from all kinds of evil. Father, when the enemy comes in like a flood, may the spirit of the living God raise up a standard. God, I pray when evil thoughts come to our mind. When fearful thoughts come to our mind and our heart, when the enemy tries to pour out his schemes upon us, Lord, and lead us away from you or bring us in confusion or doubt or keep us in bondage and separation through unforgiveness and bitterness. Father, we rebuke the enemy in the name of Jesus. And the word of God says when you rebuke the devil and stand your ground, he will flee because, Lord, you are the one who delivers us from evil. And Lord, we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. It's you alone that are worthy. You alone defeat the enemy every time. Jesus conquered sin and death on the cross, and he's given us life and abundant life. We are victors in Christ, never victims, always victors. You're no longer a sinner positionally. You're a saint in the kingdom of God if you're blood-bought and born again. All things are passing away and all things are becoming new in your life, in your mind, and in your heart. Positionally, you're right with the Father. You've been given the Holy Spirit to indwell you and empower you and lead you and guide you into all truth. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise God. And He alone is the one who delivers us from all kinds of evil. Listen, if you know who your God is... If you know his character, if you know his attributes, if you know the goodness and the grace and the mercy and the power of God, no weapon formed against you shall prosper because he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. Romans 8, 28. Praise God. All things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. All things work together for good because God allows it. That means he's doing something with it. Because all authority, all powers, all principalities in the demonic realm submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And we are covered by His blood. And we are washed by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus, for the victory. Thank you, Lord. We give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise because you alone are worthy of it, Father. And we thank you. We worship you. We praise you and we bless you. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Verse 14. If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly father will forgive you. 
But if you refuse to forgive others, your father will not forgive your sins. I'm going to repeat that again. Listen, whoever's listening to me and watching this right now, you need to hear these words from Jesus Christ himself. If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your father will not forgive your sins. If you refuse, some of you are refusing to forgive people in your life. Forgiveness is a choice. It's not a feeling and it's not an emotion. You choose to forgive because God tells us we must forgive. We choose to forgive because we love the Father. We love that He's forgiven us. And we forgive because He forgave us first and loved us first. We choose to forgive because we know that we're at a prison when we forgive. The Bible teaches us principles that when we learn to forgive others who've hurt us, who've poisoned us, who've robbed from us or stolen from us. We get out of jail. And guess who deals with them? The just judge. The Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Listen to me and listen to me carefully. Every single human being on this planet is getting their due. What do I mean before that? We are going to stand before a holy God one day. And if you are not born again, if you are not covered with the blood of Jesus Christ, you're going to be judged harshly by the Father. And the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. When the Lord Jesus is telling us this, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. If he does not forgive you for your sins, you're separated from God. And what is the judgment? Death and hell. That's the judgment. Death and hell. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Romans 6.23 Are you hearing the words of Jesus today? This is very serious business. This is what we need to focus on and pray about, my brothers and sisters. That our hearts are clean before a holy God. That our motives and intents are pure. We can't hide anything from the Lord. He knows it all. He sees it all. The Bible says in Psalm 139, He knew you even before you were formed in your mother's womb. We were fearfully and wonderfully made by the Lord. Do you know that? God knows everything about you. He knows the number of hairs on your head or lack of, in my case. He knows everything about you. He created you. And you are going to have to stand before him one day and give account. And what he wants to know more than anything else, have you been forgiven by his son, Jesus Christ? Have you accepted the gift of forgiveness through repentance and belief in his son? And then have you forgiven others who've offended you and sinned against you? There is no excuse for unforgiveness in the kingdom of God. Are you hearing me today? This is why Jesus said, many will come in my name and I will say, go for me, I never knew you. But Lord, I did this in your name and I did that in your name and I tithe and I, I fed the sick. I did miracles in your name. I cast out demons in your name. Go for me, I never knew you. Why does Jesus say that? Because they've never truly repented and forgiven those who've sinned against them because they never truly received the forgiveness and the mercy and the grace of God. So much is given, much is required. I hope you're listening today. These words that I'm speaking are life and death. They're not my words. They're the words of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I'm reading right from the text. I'm reading right from the scriptures. Matthew chapter 6. These are the red letters in the Bible. If you need to repent right now, do it. If the Holy Spirit's convicting you right now, because of what I'm teaching and preaching, repent right now. Repent of your sin. Repent of your unforgiveness. Repent of your bitterness. Repent of holding on to justifying sin in your life because you're not willing to forgive. Repent of it and turn from it right now. And receive the mercy and grace of Jesus. Receive the healing touch of the Father. Receive the love of the Father. The grace of the Father. The gift of salvation. The gift of sanctification. The gift of love. That's what the Father gives. Are you hearing me today?
Verse 16. And when you fast, don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do. For they look, try to look miserable and disheveled so people admire them for their fasting. I tell you the truth, that is the only reward they will ever get. But when you fast, comb your hair and wash your face. Then no one will notice that you are fasting except your father who knows what to do in private. And your father who sees everything will reward you. What is fasting? Listen to me. Fasting is denying yourself of physical food to spend time in prayer and intimacy with the Father. The Bible says that true prayer and fasting brings about quick results. What Jesus just said here is don't fast so other people know it or see it. Now I know a lot of churches do fasts and we've done it here. Corporate group fast. But listen, read Isaiah chapter 58 about true prayer and fasting. In that chapter it says the people went through the ritual of fasting. They denied themselves of food. But they were still complaining about their jobs. They were still treating people mean. They were not living right when they were fasting. They were not consecrating themselves before the Lord. That's not the kind of fast that God honors. When you fast, if you're going to really seek the Lord in prayer and you're asking God for things in your life that you know need healing or answers to prayer, denying yourself of food, fasting is a discipline that God calls us to do. But again, the motives and intents of the fast must be right. Are you hearing me? I can tell by some of the comments the Holy Spirit is working on hearts tonight. If there's something that was read from the scripture that worked on your heart, you repent as I said. You come to the Father and you get clean. And you allow the Holy Spirit to wash you and cleanse you and sanctify you. You allow the, the Spirit of God to give you a new heart and a new life. And all things pass away and all things become new in Christ. Allow that healing to take place. I know some of you are getting convicted and sanctified. I see it. Receive that grace and mercy from God. Amen. Praise God. Fasting is a choice and a discipline to deny yourself of food, to get serious with the Father and get alone with the Father in prayer and spend that time consecrated before the Lord. What is consecration? It's separation. It's holiness. Where your focus is on God. Your focus is on the kingdom. Listen, people, we just went through the Lord's Prayer. It took an hour. And I did it quickly because I'm doing a devotion and I want to teach on it and also praying as I'm doing the devotion. But do you see that when you apply the word correctly, do you understand that when you look at the Lord's Prayer as a blueprint, not something to just pray repetitive over and over and over again, but you look at it as a strategic battle plan for how you want to approach God. This is why Jesus broke away from his disciples. This is why Jesus spent a lot of time by himself and the disciples wanted to know, teach us how to pray, Lord. And he just did. He just taught you and me how to pray with the word of God. We read, we reflect, we respond to it. And now we walk by faith, which means we put it into action. We implement it by faith. Thank God we have the Holy Spirit living in us. Thank God that he will lead us and guide us into all truth. Thank God that even though this world is going through a lot of dark, difficult times and things, we can rise above it in and through the word of the spirit. Thank God for peace and life and wholeness and healing in and through the name of Jesus. Are you with me tonight? I'm going to close now by interceding with and for my brothers and sisters that are with me tonight. God knows your heart. God knows what you're going through right now. God knows what you've been through. And I don't want to just passively skirt over hardship and hurt and difficulty. A lot of you have been wounded deeply in your life and you've been through some very hard, difficult trials. God understands this. And he wants you to know that he loves you very much. And he gave us the word and the Holy Spirit to deliver us from all kinds of evil. To make every crooked path straight. To set the captives free. Who are the captives? We are. People that don't know Jesus are captives. When we're born again, we're saints. Because we have the Holy Spirit. We have the word. 
And God wants you free, my brothers and sisters. God wants you free in your mind. He wants you free in your heart. He wants you to live this life in a way that's pleasing to him, focused on the kingdom. And then he promises us something. All else shall be added on to you. Seek first the kingdom of God and all its righteousness and all else shall be added on to you. Isn't that a wonderful promise? Isn't that a wonderful promise that God gives us? Put him first. Focus on him. His word. Be led by the Holy Spirit. He will lead you and guide you into all truth. And when you do that, he'll take care of everything else. All else shall be given unto you. Everything you need in your life. All the healing you need. All the, the restoration you need in your heart. Some of you have been hurt. God's in the business of healing broken hearts. Do you know that tonight? The Lord is in the business of setting captives free, making you like Christ, resilient, powerful, loving and kind, merciful and graceful. All the attributes that he is, he gives to us in and through his word and by the Holy Spirit's power. I want to encourage you with that tonight. Be encouraged. Don't be one of those people that perish because of a lack of knowledge because you don't know the word and you don't, you're not being led by the Holy Spirit. Submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and receive the full bounty of blessing that he has for you. Amen. I'm gonna close in prayer. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for my brothers and sisters who have joined me tonight for a time of teaching and prayer. Father, you are a good father. You're a good God. And you give good gifts to those who ask in faith and believe. I thank you tonight for each person that's listening, that's watching right now, or that will listen or watch. I pray that the Holy Spirit and the Word would continue to wash us and cleanse us from the inside out. Would continue to make all crooked paths straight. Would continue to heal the hurt and the brokenness. That, Father, the joy and the peace of, of your kingdom would come to each and every person. And we would understand that the only way we can receive it is by faith. And faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. In Hebrews 11.1, 1, we must live by faith. And your word says if we have the faith of a mustard seed, we can move the mountain in life. You know why? Because all we have to do is have that faith in our hand and God moves the mountains. Oh God, I thank you. I thank you for your kingdom. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your love. I thank you, Father. Holy Spirit, continue that process of sanctification and transformation. Continue to heal my brothers and sisters' hearts. Continue to give them wisdom and discernment when they pray. That they would search the scriptures and study to show themselves approved. That they would wait upon you. For we know that those who wait upon the Lord, for he shall renew their strength. For they shall rise up as wings of eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not be faint. Isaiah 40, 31. Father, we wait on your timing, your presence, and your purpose. Continue that healing touch, Father. Continue to lead us and guide us forward. Deliver us from all kinds of evil. Guard our minds and our hearts in Christ Jesus. I ask this in faith, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen and amen. God bless you, my brothers and sisters. I want to leave you with this. You need to understand how much the Father loves you. You need to understand how much he's given you. He's given you his best. He's given you his son. He's given you his kingdom. He's given you healing. He's given you heaven. He's given you eternity. It's for those who call upon the name of the Lord. Remember that tonight. God bless you, and I'll be with you again soon. Tomorrow, Bible study, 10 a.m. and 7 p.m., we're studying the book of Deuteronomy. Join us, Facebook Live, 7 p.m. Tomorrow night, learn the word of God, and you will be strong. You will be with a sound mind and a sound heart, 
And the joy of the Lord will be your strength and your peace. God bless you.